Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our commanding general. Amen. Please be seated. You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers-in-arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the eliminations of Nazi tyranny over oppressed people of Europe, and the security for ourselves in a free world. Some of you may recognize some of those words. That's from the speech that General Eisenhower gave to the American Armed Forces before the battle at Normandy. Speeches like that invigorate, they rally and they encourage soldiers and people to go forth into situations that require bravery and sacrifice and danger. Well, here's another story you might have heard. Quo vadis, a Latin phrase which means, where are you marching? Or for the more more poetic types among us, whither goest thou? This comes from Peter's vision of Christ that he supposedly had when he was fleeing Rome during the persecution of Christians by Emperor Nero. And as the account goes, as he's leaving the city, he sees the crucified Jesus bearing his cross and going the opposite direction back to Rome. And he says, Quo vadis, where are you marching? To which the Lord responds, to Rome to be crucified again. Well, our epistle reading today from Ephesians 6 is one such speech written to be spoken aloud to the Christians in the church of Ephesus as they enter this new life in Christ, which is a battle with the world, a battle with the people they live next to who just moments ago were allies in the worship of a different God, are now someone that they are going to align against. Paul has addressed their concerns earlier in his letter to the Ephesians. He regards the concern of the the issues of disunity among the Gentile Christian believers and the Jewish believers. The proper life of what a baptized Christian ought to look like. And the new way their main life relationships are to be conducted. The relationship between the husband and wife, the parent and the child, and the master and his servants. All things that are now greatly different because they follow Jesus. And Paul knows, as well as Jesus does, that this is going to put them up against an enemy, up against foes. And so he's rousing them with a speech about the mission that they have been called to carry out, and it won't be easy. So what is this mission that the new Christians in Ephesus and the Christians here at Ascension Lutheran Church have been called to. Well, here's the way Paul describes it. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. How confident do you feel about facing that? Let me repeat that one more time. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, not our earthly opponents, not other people, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I don't know about you, but if my foes are described as cosmic and heavenly, That's a frightening opponent. He's not talking about our earthly foes. 
but about those that are behind them. Sin, death, and the devil, and those that seek to perpetuate those realities. How can we deal with such enemies? The answer is, we can't. You and I are unable to deal with the cosmic powers over this present darkness. We're unable to deal with the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. They are too great an enemy for us. So what is Paul doing? This is not a morale booster. It's a morale crusher. This would be like if Dwight Eisenhower said, we're going to go, but we're probably all going to get killed and lose. That's not really inspiring, and most people probably wouldn't sign up to do that. But Paul does not stop here. He doesn't stop with a mere description of our enemies. He then follows us up by saying, therefore... Because we have such great enemies, that's what that therefore means, take up the whole armor of God. In other words, you are not the one really facing these enemies. You've been equipped by God himself to confront the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly places, these cosmic powers that are beyond our ability to deal with, they're not beyond the ability of our good and gracious God. And notice here that our calling is not to go out and attack, but it is to stand firm, to endure the evil day, to withstand the assaults of these opponents of darkness. And God has not left us alone to do that because just like you and I know we cannot face these opponents on our own, so does our God and so he sends us our great Savior and General Jesus. You will be attacked. That's what Paul is saying here to the Christians in Ephesus. He's not talking about armor and warfare by accident. Now, he doesn't mean literal attacks, although that can be the manifestation of this difference between the followers of Christ and the world. He's talking about all of the voices that tempt you to not follow Jesus, to follow the world instead, to follow earthly leaders. But he's also talking about the physical persecution of believers, the murder of the saints, the martyrs that have gone on before us. You will be attacked, and the message from Paul is to stand firm. So Paul is addressing the worldly concerns of the congregation in Ephesus. Do you have worldly concerns too? Yeah, we do. And it's actually strange the degree of similarities of our worldly concerns to that of the first century church in Ephesus. He writes to them about sexual ethics disagreements. He writes to them about disagreements about what marriage is and what it ought to be and how husband and wife should relate to one another and the way children ought to be treated and the way children ought to treat their parents. He writes to them about having unity in the midst of divisions that are tempted to be between them over things that are less important than this new relationship they have with one another in Jesus. All of those are familiar to us, and many more. Worldly concerns have plagued the church from the very beginning. The temptation is often to think that the time that you now live in is the worst time there's ever been. That you're dealing with special problems that other people have not dealt with that have gone before you in the faith, and really that's not true. The human problem of sin, this enemy that that Paul is talking about for the first century church in Ephesus, is the very same enemy that we face off against as we follow Christ. They bring up the same problems, they whisper with the same voices, they destroy with the same purpose. To draw those away from the truth, to separate us from the righteousness of Christ 
to leave us alone to fend for ourselves because they too know that we are not a match for them on our own. So is there any hope of victory? You know, believe it or not, Paul is actually writing this in Ephesians 6 as a means of encouragement to boost the morale of the Christians in Ephesus who are dealing with all of these new struggles because they followed Jesus. Can you imagine how tempting it would be? The voice is whispering them to say, you know, before you were a Christian, you didn't have to deal with any of this nonsense. It would be so easy. Why don't you just give that up? Paul knows this, and so he's writing this as an encouragement. Yet, despite the fact that the enemy he describes here is great, an enemy beyond our ability to deal with, he spends even more time describing the commander, the general, the savior, who is on our side, who is leading us. Like we sung in the song Onward, Christian Soldiers, the cross of Jesus is going before us. And there's a distinct difference between the battle which Paul is calling us to as we follow Christ and all of the battles that the earthly generals have faced throughout history like Dwight Eisenhower and the speeches they've given to rally the troops. You see, when they talk and when they speak about valor and courage and things worth fighting for, the outcome of the battle which they send people into is uncertain. They don't know that they're going to triumph over their enemies. But the battle that Paul is calling to the Christians in Ephesus to follow Jesus into is a battle that has a certain outcome and it is their victory. Not a victory they have won through strength of arms or conviction, but a victory won by the one who goes in front of us, our Lord Jesus on the cross and in the empty tomb. We're not facing an army on the rise, but the last death throes of a defeated host who has already been conquered in Jesus. And that very same victorious Jesus has given you what you need to withstand the assaults of these foes. He has armed you with truth, with righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, your salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. In Jesus, you have been given all of these things. What is the truth? The truth is that God loves you, and he hasn't abandoned you or me in our sin. What is the righteousness? It is the righteousness of Jesus himself, not your own, not mine, for we cannot earn it. We have no righteousness of our own, but we are enclosed in an armor of Jesus' righteousness, the gospel of peace has been brought to you by the grace of God. This joyous truth and news that Christ has come and he has defeated the foes that you still face. The faith that he has worked in you to endure the accusations and assaults of the devil. Every time you hear that whisper in your conscience about the wrong that you have done, you now have the glorious response of our God that your sins have been forgiven. And that you are now redeemed. The salvation he won for you adorns your head like a crown of victory. Nor has he left you weaponless. He has given you his word to defeat these forces of darkness. By shining the light of Christ, the word made flesh wherever you go. Now some might be tempted to think that, well, we've got a sword, so that means we're meant to attack. But notice what that sword is. It's God's word. God's word, its purpose is not to kill other human beings. It's not meant to fight our earthly foes. But these cosmic forces of darkness by which our fellow human beings have fallen victim to, who've been deceived by and led astray, the word of God 
destroys them. So is there any hope of victory, you ask? Yes, there is. And it's a sure and certain hope. When Dwight Eisenhower gave that speech before the battle in Normandy, and any other general who gives a rousing pre-battle oratory, they're calling for courage to face an uncertain outcome. But Paul's rousing call is to face the world and all it has to throw at you because the outcome of that battle is already decided. You have won your victory in Jesus. He has given you his victory over these foes. So do not be deceived by the evil forces that cover the darkness of this world. They have been defeated by Jesus. Don't listen to their whispers. Know that you have been given what you need to defend yourself from the attacks which they throw your way. Because you've been given the gift of faith, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of righteousness and truth, and you've been armed by God's word. They have been defeated. So I ask you, Quo Vadis, where are you marching? Now you may know the end of that story for Peter. When he realizes where the Lord is going, he turns around and does what he did from the very beginning as a disciple of Jesus. He follows Jesus. And you may think that Peter loses because Peter does get martyred for his faith in Jesus. As the story goes, he was crucified for his faith in Christ by the very person he was fleeing to begin with. And someone who doesn't believe in Jesus might think, what was the point of that? Well, the reason that Peter went back was to preach the gospel, to spread this truth of Jesus to those who are nearing death, facing persecution. And that is the same today, the same calling that we have. We are to follow where our Lord leads us, even into the midst of danger, to trust in him and the certain victory he has won through his sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. So that we too can answer the call that Paul puts out here in Ephesians 6 and withstand in the evil day. Stand firm, dear brothers and sisters, in Christ. The Lord has delivered you victory. In the name of Jesus, amen.